Welcome back to another session of Better Podcasting Chats with me, I'm SP. This is a streamed and recorded casual chat with other hobby and passion podcasters to share their experience, knowledge, joy, and enthusiasm of podcasting. Once this live stream is over, I'm going to take these recorded files and turn it into a podcast as requested by the Better Podcasting community. And what is Better Podcasting? I'm glad you asked. Better Podcasting is a project by Stephen John Drew and myself to help hobby and passion podcasters start their podcasts and make their existing projects better. That's why we call it Better Podcasting. Now, for the next few moments, I'm going to take some time and I'm going to talk about my passion, which is space. So over the last week, Crew 4 returned in their SpaceX Dragon capsule from the International Space Station, marking 170 days in space. Of the four crew members, I hope to see Crew 4 Commander Chell Lindgren and Crew 4 Mission Specialist Jessica Watkins soon on a moon mission as they were both selected as two of the initial 18 NASA astronauts placed in the Artemis program. SpaceX actually stacked Ship 24 on top of Booster 7, as I mentioned last week. But then a few days later, they destacked Ship 24. It's not known why Ship 24 was destacked, but in a tweet reply, Elon Musk stated, We are proceeding very carefully. If there is a rud on the pad, Starship progress will be set back approximately six months. So that brings up the question what is rud? Well, it's a term he coined a couple of years ago, and it stands for rapid unplanned disassembly or for most other people in the world, massive explosion. Over on my other podcast, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. will be covering the Werewolf at Night Marvel one-shot, which was on Disney+. Plus. We'll be doing that this Saturday. And as I've been saying for the past three weeks, and I hope this will be the last week that I say it because I hope it is actually out this week, Smoking and Drinking in Space has a podcast that I guested on, and we reviewed the 1989 film Slipstream, which has Mark Hamill and Bill Paxton in it, and hopefully that will be available this Friday so we can all talk about it. It does have the wonderful actor Robbie Coltrane in it who played Hagrid. He passed away after we recorded the episode, but obviously before our episode is out. So we do talk a little bit about him there. In case you are new to Better Podcasting Chats with SP, if you are a hobby or passion podcaster, I am interested in talking with you. And if you want to schedule a time to chat with me about your podcasting experience or your podcast, please send me an email to stargatepioneer at betterpodcasting.com or a DM on Twitter or on Discord, and we'll arrange a date to have you on. If you don't think, I say this every week, if you don't think this applies to you, it does. I'm specifically wanting anybody from the true crime genre to come on. So if you're listening to this and you either run a true crime podcast or you know of one, please let me know and I'd be excited to chat with you. Now for the next hour, I'm chatting with a truly multi-talented creative individual. Kathleen Childs is a composer a producer, and a podcast editor who's worked in film, web media, podcast, and she's been doing some work for touring bands as well. She's an all-around sound lover and casual outdoor enthusiast, and you can find her hobby podcasting work in the actual play sphere, including the award-winning Sword of Symphonies actual play test podcast, the Roar to Heaven play podcast, the Super Idols RPG narrative play podcast, and the D20 Dames Wonderleaf Campaign, which is a tabletop storytelling podcast. Welcome to the chat, Kathleen. Hi there. It's nice to be on, SP. It's great to have you. You know, when you approached me, when I put the word out that I was looking for people here, and you said you were into basically sound design, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is going to be awesome. Uh, I, I love sound design, and... It's been really fun to get into it as uh, being a classically trained composer and then working into uh, more music production stuff and already having a background in thinking about constructing sounds in a musical context and trying to build them in completely different ways for completely different purposes. It's been a super awesome thing to learn. 
What inspired you to go down the road to build this passion of music? Well, it all started in middle school and not wanting to have to go to as many gym classes because of the overlap schedule of all of the extra and what elective classes. You signed up for band and uh, that just took up a slot and that took out uh, PE from the rotation and I got to do something that was much more fun. And I started playing oboe. I started writing music in high school. I studied music composition in college. And it just became a thing that I just always wanted to do. I have always had sounds playing in my head. I get songs stuck in my head. Immediately, I was one of those kids who was always banging on pots and pans or uh, singing. And it's just stayed with me my entire life. I've always had a great amount of respect and perhaps maybe even a little jealousy for those people that can actually compose because you're bringing together multiple different sounds and multiple different ways. It's truly a unique, creative way to think. And I wish I could. I barely can play the trumpet and look at the notes and actually play them. So that's <laughs> the extent of my musical abilities. Oh, and I will always tell anyone who has any sort of passion for music, whatever level it is, it's just more skills. It's building more things and learning different things and finding what you care about and what you like doing. I have, I play a lot of instruments at this point. Um, one of the things that I do in college is make sure that uh, composers have a lot of experience on a bunch of different types of instruments so that you can write things that sound good, that sound like something that a trumpet is supposed to do. But I have never really quite gotten into brass instruments. I can do complicated embouchures, but like the buzzing thing never quite clicked for me. So we all have our limitations, I suppose. Absolutely. You know, the buzzing thing took me several years. To do. I played the trumpet since the fourth grade on, you know, with mm -hmm. the school bands and stuff like that. I was fortunate enough to have a band in my grade school and I was able to learn it. But well, hearing back some of the tapes that the band director played from that are recorded from like our Christmas concerts, those first few years, it's uh, very embarrassing. And I'm glad that those tapes may or may not exist anymore, probably not exist anymore. Anyway. <laughs> So you've had this musical experience and inspiration, and you decided to apply it to podcasting. What inspired you to start podcasting? Well, uh, the podcast started because a good friend of mine, Kat McDonald, who is a published author and a game designer, wrote a game and was listening to a lot of actual play podcasts. And was like, I want to do one. and invited me and our mutual friends Kirsten and Nick to get together and start recording this podcast that turned into sort of symphonies. And I volunteered to edit because I was the one with the most audio tech experience. And it has turned into another passion of mine, something that I hadn't been doing and realized that I loved very much also. So where did you go to learn specifically about podcasting? You had some audio experience, but podcasting is a slightly different animal. You have to upload it online and you have to produce segregated episodes and stuff like that. Did you go anywhere to learn or did you just self-teach? I did a lot of self-teaching and I relied a lot on the fact that I already had a lot of audio tech experience. I was very... I was already very familiar with the sort of technical sides of compression and EQ and level balancing and sort of working with not multiple speakers, but multiple sound sources that you want to work together in harmony in the context of, say, like a musical mix. And it was pretty easy to apply a lot of those technical things to podcast editing. Another thing that was really interesting to me as an editor was finding a lot of experience that I'd had with linguistics and learning my second spoken language. French, I had a course in college about diction that was kind of a crash course to linguistics. And 
a lot of the ways that we talked about how language was were built in that class informed some of the things that I was able to do on sentence to sentence editing and podcasting. Hmm. Can you give an example of what you're talking about? Okay. So let's talk about how a sentence sounds in English. There is a cadence to the sound in English. You start in one places and the sound rises and falls over the course of a sentence. And then as you end, there's also this tonal element to how the sentence finishes. And I'm only exaggerating that a little bit for example right now, but Sometimes you will hear edits on, say, reality TV shows that sound really awkward, where someone will be like, well, I'm doing the thing right now. I, and you can tell that they are two separate sentences that got jammed together. And one of the reasons that you can tell that is because they don't fall in that vocal cadence together. One of my very first co-hosts happened to be a producer slash editor on a reality TV or second tier reality TV shows. But he told me that the whole process, because it sounds like that, was called Frankenbiting. <laughs> That's delightful. Yeah. And I've said so ever since. And I didn't realize that not everybody knew it because I, I just call it it's obvious to me, especially since you know you and I, we both edit podcasts. And the key to editing podcasts is to make sure, or one of the keys anyway, is to make sure it sounds like somebody is talking naturally. And in order to do that, you have to stay away from Frankenbiting. Uh, one example that I can give is the and um, right? Mm -hmm. The word and um, or two words, where there are so, you and I both know, if you take a look at the waveform on that, it is basically one word. If you want to cut the um out of that, you're probably not going to be able to do it sounding naturally, unless you can insert an end of another and that's out there, or maybe an entirely different and that's out there in there, which people do, but I stay away from that as much as possible. And I have elected in recent years just to go with the and um, because it sounds more naturally rather than frankenbiting it. So I completely understand what you're getting at. And I'm glad that that's actually a technical term, basically, of, of uh, the sentence structure into the the flow of dialogue mm -hmm. absolutely and i think talking about flow of dialogue one of the things that i have noticed that i was not expecting is that we are doing so much remote recording right now that a lot of conversations have a little bit more space than i would expect them to have especially in dialogue that's supposed to sound in the style of radio drama or film or television or like play, dialogue has this snappy quality to it that I find we lose a little bit in remote control recording just because of lag over the internet. And figuring out how I want to deal with that was a big part of the learning process for me. Yeah, it's not as simple as truncating the silence there. There's a little bit more to it, especially if you had a video element like I do on my shows. But if you're just doing an audio show, it's not always as simple as that. Matter of fact, if you run a, if you're in Audacity, for example, and you run a truncate silence, and let's just say you truncate all your silences to whatever, uh, one second, there are some cases that that pause actually needs to be two, three to five seconds, depending on how dramatic you need the shift of conversation, the shift of tone, that sort of thing. So that's just one example of needing it there. And I get what you're saying about the remote recording, because what like we're doing right now, the only true way to understand if somebody is done is to actually look at their visual cues and see if they're actually done speaking. But if you're only on like a telephone call or only doing the audio, you have to have a longer pause in there just to make sure that the other person is done speaking. Mm -hmm. And the way that we've dealt with this on sort of symphonies is that we've adapted a very much, uh, that's what the right way to say it. There are types of conversations where conversations flow by turn-taking and types of conversations that are about active engagement and interrupting. And 
one of the things that we found ourselves doing in our actual play podcast that's going in a very much storytelling kind of direction is that we've adapted a turn-taking kind of strategy where we make sure that we wait for the person who is talking to say the thing that they're talking and then start understanding that it's going to be edited later. If the pause is a little bit too long, that's fine. Kathleen's going to take it out like a week and a half later. So you record remotely, at least for Sword of Symphonies, and I'm guessing all the podcasts you're a part of. Mm -hmm. Technically, what does that involve? What program do you do you use? How do you record? And and what uh, audio gear is being used across the board? Let's just start with the connection piece. How do you connect to the other people that you are recording with? We like Discord. Discord has plenty of text options. It's got a sense of permanency. The audio codec inside of the call is not itself is not terrible. I am a little bit of a prima donna, and I do demand that everyone record locally. The rest of the people in my show generally are using Audacity. I'm recording directly into Ableton since that's my workstation of choice. But we record the local files and I sync them back up later. Do you use anything as a backup, like the Craigbot, for instance, or a hardware recorder? In some of the shows, yes. In Sword of Symphonies specifically, no, just because we've been doing this for long enough and we've had enough technical curses that adding one extra thing to the wheel sometime like just adding one extra thing that could potentially go wrong one extra point of failure is actually worse than not having it sometimes have you ever lost a recording then yes we have lost a recording and there have been a couple of recordings that we decided that the best way to do was to have someone redub essentially more or less what they were saying like adr yeah yeah it's uh we in fact have we we call it adr jail <laughs> that's what it would be i would hate to do that I, I i actually tried to do that once and i got like five minutes into like a 40 minute podcast i'm like this is not gonna work so i just it's hard just, no it's hard and it's nice in the case when you were doing fiction because there are you are already inhabiting a character, and if it's something that you have been doing for a while, like an ongoing show, you have a sense of what sort of things that your character would have done or would have said in this conversation, or you can grab things from other context clues. I tend to take pretty good notes of what goes on in a session and can have basically director cues of what the line is when we record ADR, but it's, it's hard. It's hard. It's not the optimal way to do it, but it's the way that I like best. Since you're a self-described audio prima donna, I mm -hmm. assume that audio quality at the source is probably pretty important to you. Is there a certain level of audio gear that you say, okay, this is the bare minimum? What does everybody use on your shows? Um, we have a mix of microphones, which is, I think, a case of budgets mostly. We're all using large condenser diaphragm, or we are all using large diaphragm condenser microphones and cardioid in a fairly close mic situation, because I think that adds a broadly consistent sound, and having a cue as a performer to be like, okay, I am going to be right here four or five inches from the microphone is a pretty easy thing to coach and have everybody sort of be like, okay, I'm looking at my microphone. I'm not distracted off looking at my screen or accidentally opening up Twitter during recording or something like that. I think that if you are going to just get into microphones, the very simple blue USB microphones are totally fine. Like the 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 yetis even the snowballs if you set them up correctly can do exactly what you need them to they don't have any frills they take a nice broad cut to the mids and eq very well 
But I like large diaphragm condensers, I have decided, more than I like dynamic microphones. Well, they certainly capture a more comprehensive, accurate the depiction of, of what they're being recorded into, what's being expressed into them. That's for sure. The downfall for a lot of podcasters is the ambient sounds, the reverb that enters into that. And from that perspective on Better Podcasting, we usually recommend somebody go with a dynamic microphone, but we're not necessarily doing performances. We're doing broadcast style work, which a dynamic microphone is probably better for. Let me ask you this, since uh, everybody does have condensers microphones, do you recommend that they use some sort of sound treatment or do a, a, a DIY microphone box or something like that? Yeah, sound treatment is fantastic. I am, I have been really impressed by these types of devices here. They are called often things like portable sound booths, but uh, essentially what's going on is it's a little ring of acoustic material that does a pretty decent job if you are aligning it so you're speaking directly into it of catching some of your voice before it causes reflections, essentially. Nick, when we were first starting off, made a uh, big blanket fort to record in. I have some sound treatment throughout my room. Sound treatment's great if you can do it. I think that regardless, the thing that I would recommend for someone recording at home is to close mic. Microphone sensitivity follows an R-squared law, a, uh, what's called in uh, engineering a power law. So the closer you are to the microphone, every time you double the distance away, you fall off by the square of the volume. So the closer you are to the microphone, the less gain you need to use on the microphone to begin with, and the less important, by definition, all of that background noise becomes. And if you're recording on a cardioid condenser, which, or any type of cardioid microphone, you will get a lot of proximity effect, which is par a big part of that warm radio sound that a lot of people really treasure. I have a um, Electro Voice RE320, which mitigates that proximity effect as much as possible, but I could still hear it if I get really close or really far away. I definitely can. So it's inherent in most microphones, I think, at least. Yeah, anything that's got a cardioid polar pattern. So you have these files, upload them to some sort of, the, your co hosts upload them to some sort of. Do you call them co-hosts? Do you call them other co-performers or yeah, co-hosts, other other players and performers, the crew? Okay, the crew. So, do they upload their audio files to some a cloud-based storage so you can pull it down? Yeah, we uh, back up on Dropbox or Google Docs, depending on the project. I have become a big lover of a service called a WeTransfer for directly transferring files from place to place. It can serve a whole lot of data real fast for free, and it will stay up for about a week, which is enough time to get them down where you need to. And uh, it works real fast. What format do you ask your co-host or crew to record in? Is it WAV? Is it FLAC? Is it MP3? I prefer... We have our stuff all recorded as wave does does uh, audacity record directly into flack that's kind of an interesting feature you can export into flack okay yeah so i like audio files to be some sort of uncompressed pulse channel modulation so um apple's format's fine wave is fine flack is fine most daws tend to work natively in wave so to my knowledge or at least some sort of like proprietary pulse channel format so wave is a really friendly thing to work for your big uncompressed files i would agree the only detriment to wave is those files can be huge depending oh, on huge. how long you record so sometimes 
Well, most of the time, actually, I ask everybody to give me their files in Wave so that one, it's faster to transfer because there still are internet limitations in the world, at least especially where I am. And also because when I store these, because I'm a data slut or a data whore and I keep everything, right? <laughs> and when I do that, it means I have to provide less space overall to all of these recordings that I've done literally thousands of podcasts. By now. Absolutely. So it just adds up. It absolutely does add up. And that is definitely a commitment that I have chosen to make that I am buying lots and lots of hard drives. This was actually something that I started doing in college, which is a decade ago now. Storage was, I was uh, constantly going in between the various like recording labs and moving between various spots on campuses with projects, especially if I was doing anything digital. And so I just got used to getting a lot of portable hard drives and having a hard drive that was like all of the things that I'm working on this semester or working in a like studio recording context is like, this is this EP. This hard drive represents this album. This hard drive represents this EP. And having a physical live locker full of a whole bunch of storage, which is uh, I don't know if I'd recommend that to every hobbyist, but that is a solution that has worked for me. A lot of people I know do that. I prefer to keep everything on my live computer so it backs up to my cloud backup and my on-site uh, USB external drive. I know some people use the you know the the data storage lockers at at home, the the basically the home servers with with all the mm -hmm. data on them, but. At the rate that I have data, it would be very expensive for me to do that. So I just go with the offsite backup, backblaze is what I use, and then the USB external drive. All that said, I did lose a two terabyte drive a couple of years ago, like beginning of 2020 when the pandemic started. Oof. And I did have it backed up, but the last backup was like six months prior because unbeknownst oh, no. to me, the automatic backup had stopped and I didn't notice. So I lost six months of my personal data. No podcast data was lost. That hurts. Oh. It did. I recreated most of it, but every once in a while, there'd be like a picture and like, I know I have that picture somewhere and mm -hmm. well, it must have been at the six months time that I lost the data in late 2019, early 2020. Uh, they've really saved often as uh, the old mantra was. So as you get these files and you put them into your DAW, what is your work process then? Because you're adding sound design too. Mm -hmm. I tend to attack a project in waves and stages. I like to do what is kind of broadly a dialogue edit, go through, check for flow in on the sentence level or in like a scene to scene levels, like, did we forget to do a thing? Is there a scene that we just completely ax? Is there a place where, so go through, do a quick dialogue edit, go through a second, listen through sort of more, more critical listen in terms of like, okay, where is the overall flow of this podcast, the story arc, where are we in? Where do we need to get to? What is the killer stuff that I absolutely want to keep? And is there stuff that I need to let go? And then I go through and do a pass for sound design, sound effects, or music. Sort of build it up layer by layer. And that appeals to me from a process standpoint because I really like to be able to say, okay, I have started a thing and I have completed a thing. I've gone from start to finish on something when I can. How long does that each step in there take you? It'll depend on the project. It'll depend on what I need to do. But I like to think that it takes about three times longer to do a dialogue edit than there is material recorded. Okay. Like, imagine you've listened to it, you've done a thing, and you've re-listened to it. 
and sort of like broadly speaking, you've done a thing, you've checked it, you go back and you make sure it works in context. Do you listen to it at normal speed or do you listen to it sped up? I prefer to work normal speed and avoid automatic processes when I can. Something that was really drilled into me when I was learning mixing is when you do something, do it for a reason. Okay. I've gotten to the point where I have been speeding up. I think 1.3 to 1.7 speed is about where I am, but I'm just doing dialogue panel style podcasts. I'm not doing performances where dramatic pauses might be more of an issue and, and other dialogue artifacts basically. And I'm mostly taking out the clicks, the ticks, the crutch words, those sorts of things. It's a straight dialogue edit. Every once in a while, I'll remove a section or I'll move a section around. Uh, I don't do that very often. Partly because a lot of my shows, like this one, are recorded live. So people are actually in the chat room and they're listening to it live. So if they come back to the final product later, I don't want them to be completely shocked that something is like, I thought they were talking about this like at the end and it's right up front. Like, okay, I know other people that take snippets of the conversation and do a cold opening with it. Mm -hmm. I don't do that. I do a cold lead in or a cold intro. I don't do the dialogue from a section as a cold intro, but that's an example of where you can move dialogue around. And uh, I just don't do it, but I know a lot of people do. So anyway, I'm able to listen a little bit faster, which then gets me through it, which then means I can go do other things like promote or have fun with my life or, or whatever. Absolutely. But this is a passion of mine, so that's why I do it. And I assume it's a passion of yours, and that's why you do it too. Mm -hmm. I very much have a personality where I like to just get lost in things and really go into my world where I am in my editing world, where I am in my composing world, where I am in my mixing world, and really just spend some time with it and get to know it and figure out what I want to do. It is not always the best process, but it is the process that I like. And I think that if you are doing something from a passion perspective, that's a great way to keep yourself motivated, is absolutely learn as much as you can, find what the best practices in the industry are, find out what works for people, and then find out what works for you. Like, if you do not have a million dollars of budget riding on your project, sometimes it's okay if you do something that is maybe not the best way to do something if it's something that you like more. And sometimes when you have millions of dollars on a project, you do something out of the norm and you just hope it works. <laughs> and uh, I'm referencing She-Hulk, the season finale <laughs> of that, and I won't go into depth on this because in case... People listening to this might not have seen it or care, but mm -hmm. yeah, that's something that I had to review this week on my Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. podcast. So that, that finale was definitely out of the box there. <laughs> <sighs> anyway, um, you mentioned you do, you insert the sound design. Where do you get these sounds? You create some of them, you record some of them. Where do they come from? Yeah, I've got a huge library of sounds at this point. I've collected several from some commercial sound libraries. I had a, I've had subscriptions to some of the sound design sites and applications like Soundly. And I like to, uh, especially recently, I've started recording a lot of field recordings on my own. My partner is an ecologist and works at a big land trust out here in the Northeast. And we uh, go outside sometimes and we camp sometimes. And I will just take my uh, little uh, Zoom handheld recorder and leave it out to record the sounds of the wild for some time. And I get all sorts of really rich, really interesting very natural sounds with 
big, wide stereo fields that I think add a great sense of verisimilitude when you are using them for an appropriate outdoor scene in a piece of media. Are you just using the XY microphones on the recorder or do you bring other microphones with you? I use the XY recorder mostly because they're rugged. They've got a good stereo field. You put on some, uh, I, I forget what they call, I always call them dead cats in my mind to keep down a <laughs> wind stuff. Yeah, the, the windscreen slash dead cat. The windscreen, yeah. yes. And I think it works just fine. I think they were I think they work good and I am pretty new to field recording. So I am sort of just dipping my toes in and I am sure that if you ask me five years from now about my opinions about the best microphones for field recording, I will have something exhaustive to say about them. Well, I will say I do own several Zoom handheld recorders, a H5, an H6, actually two H6s, an H8 and uh PodTrack P4. So I own a lot of them. The ones with XY microphones, they were actually designed to record bands in live performance environments. So they're pretty good at picking up environmental sounds, in my opinion. Now, like you said, you could probably get more specific. Like if you're going from an actual cricket sound, you might want to get that shotgun microphone a foot away from it as it's chirping or something like that. But For the most part, since you're getting broad scenic sounds, the XY microphones should do fine, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I there is something magical about getting really deep within a forest where there are not any planes flying overhead and just hear the wind move through the forest. You hear birds reverberating throughout the trees. I am so proud of some of these recordings that I've gotten that have little insect flybys that go all the way from the left to the right of stereo field with the XY. And there's something that I find really delightful about recording just really honest, natural sounds and being able to bring them back out of the wild to uh, remember them in my more domestic life. You must spend days going through those recordings to grab certain aspects of it. If you're looking for something specific, you are looking for a long time. If you just need a sound bed, sometimes you can just like grab it, audition it for a little bit and be like, yeah, that's probably okay. There's other things going on. But... (laughs) Yeah, if you if you want to process it, like you're taking if you're taking a 30 minute recording, that's just going to that's just a nightmare to try to process everything. Oh, yeah. I mean, just me looking for sounds for as bumps for other podcasts. It takes me days, some to weeks sometimes as I'm looking through it. Matter of fact, we Stephen and I, the other co-hosts on the Better Podcasting main show, we talk a lot about the main thing that we decided on for the Better Podcasting show. It actually took us a couple of months to come to that. And that was two of us looking through existing libraries of Pond 5, Audio Jungle, that sort of stuff. Finally found what we wanted and we decided to go for it. I think at that point in time, we were both like, just be done. I just want to move on with something else. Like, it's a lot of work to write music. It's also a lot of music, or it's also a lot of work to find music to use in the thing that you want. The, the nice thing about uh, when you're composing your own music is you can be like, okay, I know what I want it to do and where I want to do it. And so I know the timings. I know the sound palette that I'm using. If you are having to go through the library and find the things that match and hope that the stars align, that you're getting the thing that you want, that's also a lot of work. Podcasts are tough because you are one person doing so many roles from an audio production perspective. If you look at a film, you will see a whole ton of audio roles. You'll see uh, recording engineers, you will see re-recording, you will see mixing, you will see music direction. All of these things are separate jobs. And when you're a podcast producer, you're doing all of them. Especially for a fictional sort of podcast that's more like a Uh, a movie or a radio play or something like that, like an audio drama or an actual play podcast. I'm 
coming to the conclusion that there are a ton of really well done, musically bedded, actual play podcasts and audio dramas that I'm really happy that we have those sorts of productions going on at all different levels. You know, you do have the professional ones. The ones that I know about are more like, you know, the Marvel ones, but I mm-hmm. do know that there's more out there. And yeah. I know that uh, I used to listen to audiobooks all the time. And when you had an audiobook with a sound design to it, it was incredibly more entertaining to me, I guess, uh, is one way to put it. It's not necessarily any different than reading it on the page in terms of content, but the experience is different. So I always have enjoyed that and so uh, kudos to you and and people like you that do what you do it's it's really bringing the art of the audio podcast to a new level that not everybody i mean this has absolutely no sign design to it the w- one that we're doing right now but my other podcasts have an intro and outro and they have all sorts of bumps in between and i i don't bed anything but mm-hmm that's kind of an experience and it is i'm glad to be providing that as an industry to the listener Mm -hmm. i have always been of the opinion that work is work regardless of what the content or context is and finding the perfect bump for your interview podcast is a skill and it really makes the difference One of the shows that really inspired me when I was first getting into podcast is a lot of the NPR storytelling and nonfiction shows, things like Radio Lab or This American Life, that kind of mix that journalistic uh, quality with this sort of more experimental documentary and storytelling aspect to them. And the editing in the early seasons of Radio Lab was totally mind blowing to me. Yeah, I think the genre genre is narrative storytelling. I think mm-hmm. is what they choose to call it. At least I think that's what's in the NPR audio guide. And you have to go back to to check. But yeah, it's amazing what's done there. And unfortunately, they have staffs of fifteen or twenty per show. Oh, absolutely. I can't compete with that. So I just no. go with what I can. So you have had the wonderful opportunity to compete some of your work in some award shows Mm -hmm. and you've actually won a few awards for your work. Yes. So the sort of symphonies has won several awards at the New Jersey web fest. A web fest is It's a sort of a film festival. Web fests started cropping up in, I think, the 2010s. I am sorry, anyone who knows more about me with this, but as a place to have a film festival sort of attitude for web content, especially web series and like short films and that sort of stuff in a digital context. And Over the last couple of years, WebFests have started including fiction podcasts in their lineup. Sort of Symphonies last year at New Jersey won the Best Actual Play podcast and won the Best Ensemble cast. And this year, our co-host Kat won Best GM. We have been nominated also for some awards in a couple of other WebFests that are yet to occur this year, so fingers crossed. And web fests are fantastic. Film festivals are a lot of fun. Growing up in Colorado, got to go to Aspen and some smaller film fests a couple of times. And these are not like Aspen. These are not like Cannes. These are much smaller creative and industry-focused affairs for the most part at web fests. And that's why they are fantastic. Everyone who goes to a web festival 
is there because they are making something and they're passionate about it and they want to talk with other people about it. They want to show their work. They want to talk about their work. And it is really refreshing. And I think really vital sometimes to get together with other people who are working on projects, whether it is a hobby situation or if it is your profession, and talk about process in a real world or just like be like, hey, I'm doing this thing and this thing, what are you doing? And there's an energy of being around other creatives that I love that has been really revitalizing for me. And every time I've come back from one of these web fests, I've wanted to do a new project. I've wanted to work on something more. And it's a little bit like your show where you just get to talk to people about a thing that people are passionate about, that they have a lot to say about. There are web fests in most major cities, there's a circuit that goes all kind of throughout the late summer and fall, and you should look up your local one. I've been to podcast conferences before, which is more industry based, right? And those I don't come away to inspire. Matter of fact, we tell most hobby podcasters look, if you are interested in improving your show, I would throw your money into better artwork, better audio sound design, better audio equipment to sound a little bit better, maybe some services or DAWs, some computer programs that will make your life easier and make your show more listenable and just make the whole process more enjoyable to you rather than spend. And I came up with this number a few years ago, like podcast movement it moves around every year. So it really depends on the travel and stuff. But if you pay for the airline ticket, to the hotels, which is during the week, by the way. So if you're a hobby podcasters and you have a full-time job, you're actually taking time off of work to go do it. And then the conference tickets themselves and then food and, and everything while you're there, which arguably is more expensive than you would be at home. You're racking up quite a bill of somewhere between two and twenty five hundred dollars, depending on airfare. Like if it's in your city, you don't have to pay for the hotel or the airfare or anything like that. But if you're traveling somewhere, you're roughly in that dollar amount. And most hobby podcasters, that's more than their budget of their show for ten years. So I would recommend that they don't go to podcast conferences because you're not going to really get that much out of it that you wouldn't get by listening to other podcasts about podcasting. That's not to pump up better podcasting itself at all, but it's just meant to say that you're going to get the same amount of information from those podcasts about podcasting and maybe an online course or something like that than you would going to this place in person. Yes, you get all hyped up uh, by being around other podcasters and being in an event that's podcast focused, but it's podcast industry focused. Yes. You bring up a fantastic point with these web fests, and I've been paying attention to it in the in the back of my mind for quite some time. I have not been to a, a true web fest yet, but those are places that are not just serving audio dramas or actual play podcasts, but all sorts of podcasting. And I would heartily recommend anybody that's passionate about making their podcast that they would attend one of these web fests because you're going to be around other people that are just so passionate about it. You're going to be around other podcasters and not necessarily the industry of podcasting. You're going to make those connections to possibly voice actors or other players in the actual play or other producers that can give you tips and tricks on how to make your, your podcast better. Or maybe it's a show you, you listen to you're like, Oh, how do you do this? And you actually get to talk to them or maybe see them on a panel or something like that. I think web fests are far more valuable to the hobby podcaster than a podcast conference would ever be. I would agree. And that's what I love about web fests is they are really strongly, even the people who are in the professional sphere who go to web fests, we are talking about people who are doing passion projects who are really ex- who are doing things and maybe they're pitching them to networks but most of the time they're someone who's excited to show off what they do and to talk about it and to 
just meet people and have a good time. And you learn a lot about the industry. And like you said, you make you meet people. I have made so many friends just uh, going to down to New Jersey and uh, coming back. And it has just been really life affirming for me. Well, first of all, congratulations for being able to leave New Jersey. That's a tremendous uh, accomplishment right there. Sorry, everybody that's listening to this in New Jersey. That was a joke at your expense. I'm sorry. I was born in Brooklyn, New York, so sue me. And um, the other thing is, yeah, congratulations again on your awards. That is huge in podcasting to win any award, no matter if it's just uh, a regional web fest or if it's a national or international award it doesn't really matter in my book to be able to compete with your peers and to be able to come away with a win means that you've not only put the passion into your project but you've been successful in integrating it into your show and uh, sort of symphonies is like that it's a but sort of symphonies is an actual play test right so yes. that's an interesting term right there play test yeah so Part of the process of developing a any type of game is you write the game, you write the rules, you write the world, you put all of the things together that you need in order to make it function. But the map is not the territory. How the game plays is not necessarily what you think that you wrote down. And inevitably, you're going to find things that either work not as well as you thought or work differently than you thought, or new things emerge that you're like, oh, this is really interesting. I want to capture this and make sure that we know that this is what people are going to do with it. And that phase is the playtesting phase. You have to Actually take the thing that you've worked on and put it in the hands of other people and see what they do with it. So Kat wrote this wonderful little tabletop role-playing game called Heroic Chord and wanted to do a live playtest of it. Wanted to make an actual play podcast about the playtest. And so... We've essentially done all of the things that we love about it, uh, even sort of symphony. So we have this game that Kat has worked passionately on, and then we're recording, we're storytelling, and we are going back and looking at the game and seeing what stories it allows us to tell, where are the places where there are frictions that we don't like. And Heroic Chord has changed substantially over the course of recording the podcast just because of what happened when we were playing it. And the game is much better as a result. Awesome. Well, is this something that would be considered to be something that would be done at a convention like Gen Con? Yeah. So at a convention like Gen Con, you will have what is called a uh, public play test often if you are working on a game. Many conventions will have tables, essentially, where you can book as a GM or as a game creator and uh, bring people to the table with you and play a short little thing together. And you can take notes and you can see what total strangers do with your game, too. Which that must is be fun. also extremely important. Yeah. It's fun. It's nerve wracking. And it's an important part of the stage as well, because generally in your private playtest like what's going on in sort of symphonies you are working with people that you know you are able to guide what's going on and if something isn't working you can say like okay so we intended it to work this way even if it's working this way in practice and then go back and be like okay so how do we make this less ambiguous and then when you give it to total strangers and you see what they do with it then it's like okay well this works still this doesn't work this they just completely ignored so then you go back and start re-editing and redrafting and continuing to mold the game it's a fascinating development cycle right there oh yeah so thinking back over the course of i don't know what, what do you got like 50 60 episodes of sort of symphonies now oh we've got 
Yeah. Yeah. We've got uh, 50 episodes in season two. We oh, have wow. We've been recording a weekly show and it has been a lot of work and a lot of fun. So aside from the fun that you have recording and uh, putting together the actual finished product with the music beds, what's a favorite moment that you had from the podcast? It doesn't have to be your favorite moment, mm-hmm. but what's one that comes to mind in all of your podcasting? doesn't necessarily have to even be sort of symphonies. Well, one of my favorite moments of Sword of Symphonies, and one of the things that I love about using tabletop role-playing games, or coincides sort of with one of the things that I love about tabletop role-playing games as storytelling tools. Storytelling is hard. Improvised storytelling is not any easier. And using a game or a scaffold of some sort to sort of give some structure to your improvisation and to your storytelling is really valuable. And having sort of that structure allows you to be really creative with things. There is a moment at the end of the first season of Sword of Symphonies where Nick, who is really detail-oriented when he wants to be and really patient about cool ideas that he has, asks to use one of the, hmm, I guess I should just describe uh, this uh, role-playing system real fast. The magic system in Heroic Chord, it takes, is is sort of wordplay based. You take a word that the game master tells you is in the environment and a word that is associated with your character and create a spell. Like if you're on the open ocean, there might be a spell piece that is like vast and maybe your spell piece has the spell piece wind or something. And you can create, then you can say like, I want to cast the spell vast wind to take the ship someplace, for instance. At the second to last episode of the first season, Nick finally asks Kat, the question that he has clearly been thinking about for the entire run of the podcast. The first season of Sword of Symphonies takes place mostly on a big ship. And so he asks Kat, what spell piece does the ship have? And it's such a beautiful moment to use as the sort of capstone of the arc to be like, this, is, this place has been our home what does it have to say in this magical context? And also just a brilliant use of game mechanics to create this cool moment that we might not have had in any other context. Awesome. I can see it building up. Like you're, you're, you're using the ship throughout the season. You're traveling on it. It's your home. And then all of a sudden, hey, what, can, what does this have to contribute to us? Because you're probably in the next season moving away from the ship. So it's a piece of the ship that you can take with you. Yeah, awesome. it was a really, really wonderful moment and very, it was, it's the sort of thing that can only happen in actual play or at least happen in that way in actual play. You've been podcasting for a few years now, I'm mm-hmm. guessing like three or so years. That's about right. Yeah. Yeah. Three years. So what? If you could go back in time three years ago before you started podcasting and tell yourself one thing that would help you in your podcasting journey, what do you think you would tell yourself? Mm. I think the piece of advice that I need to give myself personally the most often is stick to the is choose the scope that you want to use and stick to it. If you make, for, for me specifically, if I make a decision about how I'm going to approach something, I'm going to want to keep it consistent and keep it still. And I am so susceptible to wanting to do one more thing and to add one new thing or, and scope just balloons and balloons and balloons. and having the discipline to be like, okay, this is what I am doing. This is the plan. Leaving enough room that you can follow creativity where it's going to take you, but like 
stick to the script, stick to spec is such a huge important part of being an audience of being an artist or being any type of creator. Being able to be like, I'm going, I know what I'm going to set out to accomplish and I'm not going to get too distracted by all of the wonderful other things out there. I'll give you a perfect example, at least in my mind, of to exemplify wh exactly what you're talking about. So most hobby podcasters start off by recording together around a friend's table or in their dorm room or whatever. And then eventually they're all like watching Joe Rogan or whatever. And they're like, you know what? We should do video. And mm -hmm. I realize we're doing video right now, but for most podcasters that are audio only, they think the step up to video is not that hard. Anybody can stream, anybody can use their phone and stream to uh, Twitter spaces or YouTube or Twitch or anything like that. It's not a big deal. We can make this work. And then they get into it and it becomes so much more exponentially difficult to add in video. Some of them want to bring in six camera angles and not just like remote six cameras, like connecting on a big zoom call, but oh, no. oh, like no. six cameras and, and trying to switch back and forth. And some of them want to actually record all that. And then they, they think it's just editing like a big multi-track audio podcast. And on one point, Yes, I will say, yes, it is exactly like that. And another point is like, you have no idea the complexity that you're bringing forth, especially if you're doing 4K video, there's a ton of resources that is required. Just have, I have a strong gaming computer right now, like one of the best that you can buy with modern components right now in the fall of 2022. And it struggles with multiple 4K streams in uh, Vegas uh, edit, uh, the Vegas Pro uh, editing program that I use. You're not going to do any better on a Mac. It's still mm -hmm. going to struggle with all of that. And just people just don't understand. They, they want to do it because they see it. They see the success. They see the notoriety. And it's like, no, you should just stick with what you have in your audio podcast. And I realize I'm a little bit not practicing what I preach because this is an audio uh, visual video stream as well. But that's just an example. Stick to what you know, stick to your scope of what you set out to do and just keep it there unless you have a compelling reason to change. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like that bit of advice. Uh, yeah, it's, you have to ride a little bit of a knife's edge on that because I think it is important to give yourself new challenges, to keep yourself engaged with creativity. But you have to be aware of how much time it takes to do things and how much creative energy you have to spend on your project. And don't, and biting off more than you can chew is the most demotivational thing that I run into with any sort of occurrence when I am trying to make art. So I'm, I'm trying to do too much. I am trying to do more than what I need to do to get the job done. Yeah, sage advice. Well, before we start closing up, is there anything else that you want to tell the audience of Better Podcasting? You should make your podcast. Make your podcast. The world needs more indie media. And we can all get cynical on Twitter and be like, this, uh, there are so many of X type of show. There are like what more is there to say about x media property but it is so satisfying to be able to take something that really belongs to you and make it and feel like you are expressing something and that you are working together with either yourself or working together with other people to make something making things feels great and it is always fun to have more voices my favorite videos that i've watched on youtube have less than a thousand views some of my favorite podcasts are tiny little things that just hit this right thing that i am particularly interested in i like hearing more voices 
Sage advice, indeed. Actually, that's one of the reasons why Better Podcasting was made. There's a lot of podcasts about podcasting, but they were all either industry-based or consultant-based or whatever. And we're like, nobody's speaking to the hobby podcaster. They all want to make money, which, don't get me wrong, more money would be good from any podcast, but there's a sort of realistic expectation for a hobby podcast. Like, If you're only getting 150 downloads per episode over 30 days, you're not going to be able to monetize the way the big boys do. So might as well make your podcast better, promote it a little bit more. It's going to take a lot of hard work and it's going to take some lucky breaks, but you need to focus on that for a while. And that's what better podcasting is for, is to help people make their their podcast better to get to that point. So that's just an example. This is the only one in the entire genre of podcasts about podcasting that we know of. Now, granted, there's three different versions of better podcasting. There's the main show, there's live chats that we, you know, Stephen and I did, and then there's this this chat that we're doing here but uh yeah it's it's the only it's the only property well kathleen thank you so much for coming on you've enlightened me in the terms of sound design and play test podcasting i really appreciate it this is a fascinating genre of podcasting which i don't think gets enough talk so thank you so much for coming on thank you for having me sp this has been a blast and if somebody wants to see or hear Sword of Symphonies, or any of your other works, where would you send them? You should search for Sword of Symphonies on your podcaster of choice, or our recently kickstarted campaign, Roar to Heaven, which is a 13-episode uh, anime-inspired action audio drama thing. It is kind of nuts and has been a lot of fun to work at. Look at your local podcaster. You can find the show also on Twitter at Peach Garden RPGs or the website peachgardengames.com. All right. Look forward to that. And I will put the links in the show notes. Again, thank you so much for spending the last hour or so with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right. And thank you for spending your time with Kathleen and myself over the past hour. If you like content like this, please subscribe to the Better Podcasting YouTube channel and like the video, ring that bell for future notifications. Or if you're listening to the audio version, give Better Podcasting Chats with SP a follow on your podcatcher app of choice. Stephen and I would greatly appreciate it. I was just talking to him today about it. As a matter of fact, so next week on Tuesday, October 25th, 2022, I have some time scheduled with writer, podcaster, voice actor, and audio editor, Wesley Bryant. Wesley is part of the Thornvale Playthrough Podcast crew and is also moderating a new Discord server specifically for actual play podcasts. So learn all about that next week, Tuesday, October 25th, 2022 at 8 p.m. Eastern time, streamed on the Better Podcasting YouTube channel. In the meantime, Please join Stephen and myself with the podcasting conversation on our Discord server, betterpodcasting.com slash Discord. You can find both Stephen and myself there every day. And with that, we will see you next time. Bye.